All right, so today I will be learning and showing some important linear algebra sort of foundations for quantum computing, um, specifically going over the eigenvectors, eigenbasis for the Pauli gates, and finally getting into the Hadamard gate. No, no circ yet and no two qubit stuff yet but hopefully next time there will be, there will be some circ and some epr states so first of all when we consider some matrix or vector v here i am using dirac notation i.e this corresponds to some set of values like so. Um, the eigenvalues for a matrix A are the values that satisfy this equation. So basically, <clears throat> the matrix A on this eigenvector has the same effect as multiplying by this value. And this is a numerical constant, just some number. It doesn't have to be real. Um, I'll just say And so this is a pretty well-defined um, problem in linear algebra and mathematics, a huge huge area of interest. And so I, I won't go into all of that, just what's relevant for the basics of this quantum computing. So first we wanna say, okay, how do we solve this? We'll get into the gates and why it's important later. So we have this equation, which we can then modify to be, because an identity matrix, remember, changes nothing, where that's the identity, then we can subtract and get and then factoring out the B, we see that from here we can solve for the eigenvalues. Um, after we have the eigenvalues, we can plug them back in to get the eigenvectors. So let's just do this, for example, with the poly x gate. And so the poly x gate, or the poly x matrix, remember, is this. And so in order to solve this problem, uh, all we have to do is use the formula on the previous page in order to evaluate the eigenvalues from which we can get the eigenvectors. So first thing we need to do is find what is called the characteristic polynomial. So we take it and we subtract lambda from the diagonals, as was indicated by the identity matrix, because remember the identity matrix is just the diagonals. And then we see that, oh, I should, it should actually be the determinant, my bad. The de determinant of that is equal to zero, from which um, we can see that it's pretty simple to solve. Remember the determinant for a two by two matrix is AD minus BC if we have a matrix A, A, B, C, D. So we get negative lambda times negative lambda, which is lambda squared minus one. So it's easy to see that lambda equals plus or minus one. So the eigenvalues for the poly x matrix are plus and minus one. And this, so this might be a reoccurring trend that we see in terms of the eigenvalues. 
So then how do we figure out the eigenvectors? Well, all we have to do is take this matrix now for each eigenvalue. Remember that the eigenvector is associated with one eigenvalue. Plug it back in. So we get for plus one, we have the matrix one, 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 one times the eigenvalue. Oh, I should say this is for lambda equals plus one times the two components here. And so if we simply multiply them out, we get two equations and two unknowns. We get negative x1 plus x2 equals zero. And we get x1 minus x2 equals zero. From here, we can see that uh, x1 and x2 are both equal to, so the eigenvalue of one has associated eigenvector one, one. Uh, I won't go through the process for deriving the, the other uh, associated um, eigenvector. But it's important to note that uh, with these, any remember that any uh, vector uh, can be multiplied by a constant and still maintain um, that property. So you can normalize them. So 1, 1 normalized becomes 1 over the square root of 2, 1, 1. And then for the, the other... Um, or that um, eigenvalue, we get uh, eigenvector of one negative one. And for the y, poly y, I won't go through them. They have all polygates, have eigenvalues of plus or minus one, and associated eigenvectors of one and i, and one and negative i. Now for the z gate, which remember is written as one, zero, one, zero, zero, negative one. We can solve this out um, to get the eigenvalues of one and negative one. If we just um, do one minus zero, negative one minus here, we get one minus lambda. One minus lambda. Conveniently, this is already written in our sort of factored form. So we can see this is plus one and minus one. So we have from these two values the associated um, corresponding eigenvalues. And with them, we can calculate the eigenvectors. And now we'll begin to see why this is important. So if we have negative one, one, plug in negative lambda here, then we can see that the solution is where lambda equals plus one, we get uh, zero, x1 plus 0, x2 equals 0, which is trivially true. And we get 0, x1 minus, or I should say, oh, I, that's my mistake, um, 0, x1. This is plus 1, so it'll be minus 2 x2 equals 0. From here, we can see that this is um, seems to have no solution. But what we really see here is basically that 
x is a free variable and so it can be anything and so we just set it to x equal to 1 just for example so we see that the associated eigenvector is 1 0 and the for negative 1 it is 0 1 so from here now we can begin to see why this is relevant because these two eigenvectors form a so-called eigenbasis of 0 and 1, which we have already seen as the pure states. And this is important because what, what we didn't say last time and what usually isn't said is this, this is just a way of representing these states uh, in a certain frame of reference almost, in a certain basis. And this is in the Z basis. Um, because it is from the poly Z matrix. And the eigenvalues here can form a basis because they are um, orthogonal, not just a basis, but a orthonormal basis because they're orthogonal to each other, necessary for a basis, and they are also normal, i.e. their magnitude is 1. And so... This, this state here is important, and but importantly, can also be changed. And so what we see here is that this Z basis is usually the standard basis, and, and is, it is called the, often called the computational basis for this reason, just because the notation is simple, we have the zero, and that just corresponds to spin up and 1 corresponds to spin down, which is just very straightforward. But it's not always represented in that manner. There's also the z. Uh, in addition to the z, there's also the x basis, which is represented via these numbers. And we have the pure state here represented by... Because if, if you consider... Uh, wave function at the positive end of the x-axis, we can see that's a superposition of 0 and 1 in terms of the z basis. And so this is important. Um, usually everything is done in the z basis just out of ease and convenience, but it's, it's all the same. The same things that you do in the x basis is just a different way of representing it. So any operation can be converted into any other basis. They're all representing the same thing. Um, and, and it's important to recognize that um, each Pauli matrix has an eigenbasis that can serve as a basis for evaluating quantum computers. And so now, um, finally, we are moving away from the Pauli gates and into the famous Hadamard gate or the H gate. And so this gate is represented by um, the matrix of 1 over it's uh, 1 over the square root of 2 in front as each value is divided by 1 over the square root of 2. And so we just take it out usually as standard practice. And So, oh, I just realized that it's not visible. So we have 1 over the square root of 2 times 1, 1, 1, negative 1. And you'll often see this written um, if applied to multiple gates independently. You'll see it as something like this for however many gates, or you might see something like this. There's a lot of different possible notations. And so what does this do? Why is this gate important? This gate is important because when you apply it to the pure state, it converts it into a superposition of two states. And this is why this gate is seen so often. Or you could also write it as in that notation. In addition, I won't do the calculations here, but 
the Hadamard gate also has eigenvalues plus or minus one, and it has the eigenvectors, um, not as pretty <laughs> as the other ones, but it has uh, the eigen associated eigenvectors of plus or minus square root of two plus one. One. And that, that can be calculated via the same process. And so this is an important gate because it can be applied to arbitrary min, arbitrarily many quantum bits to get a superposition. So if we consider the previous state, um, just for example, um, not doing any sort of interactions here, so it's not doesn't really matter that there's multiple qubits. This transforms this state into the superposition of all of these, or this is also sometimes written. When you deal with these larger binary strings, it'll just be written as their binary conversion And this is why uh, the Hadamard gate is one of the most important and most commonly used gates in quantum computing. Um, it also can be represented in a number of different ways. Um, you could represent it as a X rotation and then half of a Y rotation, or this is also. Um, so that, that makes sense. You're you're basically flipping it in the x direction and then halfway flipping it in the y direction. You could also do z. Those are all valid ways of describing this. And so now that we've seen the importance of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and specifically the z eigenbasis, we can begin to move on to the actual meat of quantum computing, which is a lot of the algorithms. Um, and so, but before we do get to that, next time uh, we'll talk about entanglement and that the role that that plays. And specifically, we'll look at the EPR state and maybe mention a little bit about the importance of that for quantum teleportation or quantum key distribution. Uh, but for now, we've seen the importance of eigenbases and the importance of the Hadamard gate, specifically for inducing superposition.